Center, Duke NUS, and he'll be speaking on the role of micropulse laser in glaucoma. Is it worth it? Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So I've been given the title of Micropulse Laser, Is It Worth It? And I'll be going through some various case scenarios with you and working out where it stands in our armamentarium before finally giving you a cost-benefit analysis. These are my financial disclosures, none of which are relevant for this particular presentation. Now, as you can see by this following statistics, glaucoma surgery is stagnating. You can see the numbers of our trabecular plasties and iridotomies are quite stable, and our glaucoma procedures have also leveled out at a particular uh, plateau. The, there's also been a, a concurrent decline in transcleral cyclopid coagulation, as you can see by the downward trend. But also, uh, that's been balanced out, but more than balanced out, actually, by an increase in endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation. And that's only up to 2012. So what happens after that? We have a, a series of current options for refractory glaucomas, ranging now from MPTCP, the micropulse TCP, traditional tube surgery, and cyclodestructive procedures like transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, which you've seen before. There's been a need for this treatment, this new micropulse treatment, because of some of the devastating side effects of the traditional uh, cyclophotocoagulation. You can have the pain, inflammation, high femur, conjunctival burns, progression of cataract, chronic hypotony, and the pressure spikes, and finally the, the loss of vision that you can get. Also quite devastating is the sympathetic ophthalmia you can get in the fellow eye as well. These have been well documented in the past, and there's been a, a push to have something that is safer. Now, the European Glaucoma Society mission statement says the goal of glaucoma treatment is to maintain the patient's visual function and quality of life. But what people also forget is that it does say at the end, at a sustainable cost. And with the increase in healthcare costs proceeding at an exponential level at the moment, there's a definite need to put a rein on this. The Micropulse TCP works similar to our traditional diode laser, but what it does, it cuts up the pulses into small bursts, and hence it avoids the thermal increase that you get, which is normally associated with the, the diode laser, the continuous wave diode laser. Here's some examples uh, in, a, in an illustration and in real life Apple Miyagi views of the continuous wave on the left, and you can see the contraction burns that occur at the ciliary processes. This is due to a thermal effect. And you can see also the contraction at the ciliary body here when a pulse is applied. In contrast, when you look at the micropulse technology on the right, you can see that the, the laser spot moves over but doesn't cause any obvious um, reduction in the, um, uh, the, the scleral fibers. And, and it's a very, very subtle movement, if anything, of the ciliary body. We know that t standard TCP is very destructive. If I can take your attention to some of the pictures here, you can see here that there's a classical uh, area of destruction of uh, coagulative necrosis that occurs when you use the standard cyclodiode. Whereas if you look at these pictures of the MPTCP, they look virtually unchanged. And this all fits in with some histological um, evidence also about the mechanism of action of micropulse. The idea actually is that it works on outflow and is a very non-destructive procedure. And it causes like, it's like a slow cook of the area. So what that essentially does is makes the area more susceptible to uh, aqueous outflow by a uveoscleral approach. This has been evidenced also by finding latex spheres in the aura serrata. And actually there was a change to change the name of this treatment from what was originally going to be a um, cyclophotocoagulation to a cyclophototherapy. A very simple treatment is uh, performed where you place it perpendicular to the sclera here and you slowly move it around between the top half and the inferior half as well. Now, there wasn't very much guidance about the speed, how much you press, how much uh, viscoelastic coupling agent to use, but recently at WGC, they came out with these new guidelines on how it should be used ideally, and we've been putting them into practice. I'll be showing you some of our local data on this right now. So here's a short video to show the difference between TCP the, with the pops and MPTCP, which is just slowly moving this around the eye. And this is the sort of speed that you should be doing it at. Slowly moving it around, and it's in a different position and different angulation to the TCP. 
this is the use of a coupling agent. As you can see, the laser spot becomes a lot more focused when it's put into the coupling agent. And when it's outside, it's not so focused. Here it's focused, and then it's not so focused. It is asymmetrical as well. So and if you look on how it's being used, you can see a wide variety of, of methods. Even on YouTube now, if you pull up videos of Micropulse TCP, you can see it being used with this end towards the limbus and this end towards the lid in some cases. The correct way is this blunt end is towards the lid. Now you can see how it should be used like this, not like this, and this angulation as opposed to either of these two. These results from our center, uh, looking at um, what we've been um, using for the last few, few years now. And you can see that comparing tube TCP and MPTCP, you've got vastly different curves. The tube group comes down uh, from very low level to about 26 IOP and stays very low to about 12. You can see the MPTCP has been traditionally used in much more uh, uh, recalcitrant and difficult to treat glaucomas comes down very dramatically and finishes up around about 18, 19. And, and the MPTCP has also a very much more gradual approach. In this study that we did, we looked at the uh, about 90 patients with MPTCP and about 30 in TCP and tube group. And we had a similar age group, male gender, and a similar number which had primary and secondary glaucomas. The only big difference, though, was in their pre-op visual acuities. The TCP group had far worse visual acuities. And this is also evident on their uh, visual field mean deviation as well. If you look at the number of retreatments that had to be applied, over one third of the MPTCP had to have another procedure. If you look at what was actually done, many of them was a repeat MTC, MPTCP, but some were glaucoma filtration surgery, glaucoma drainage devices, and even a traditional TCP as well. In the traditional TCP group, a few people had a MPTCP. Of course, in the uh, tube group, they only had tube revisions and laser PIs. So to use our results and compare them to other studies, we can see the results of uh, Ziad's group in um, Lebanon here at the bottom our group here, and this is the uh, group from NUS, the original study, looking at recalcitrant glaucomas. You can see the curves are quite similar, but obviously very overlapping uh, um, in confidence interv intervals. Now, the original studies that looked at the time and energy said that you should be using about 160 and 100 millijoules. But some of these studies, that especially for refractory glaucomas, were using much, much more, 320 seconds and 300 seconds. And those as I was saying, how you do these actual lasers, you put half on top and half on bottom. So to get 160 seconds, you'd be doing 80 on the top and 80 seconds on the bottom. So for when you were doing 320, this is like quite a lot more than what was the original projected time of the laser procedure uh, for, for the, what the Iridex was originally planning. Now, Ziad's group has produced a much more a reasonable value here for uncontrolled glaucoma patients that quite, span quite a variety of those with good visual acuities, not so advanced, all the way to the recalcitrant ones as well. Now, of course, in the refractory glaucomas, when you do pump the power up, you do get a, more of an effect. And the results here show up to 40 to 50% IOP lowering. But of course, what comes with that is significant amounts of inflammation, up to 41%. In the moderate to severe glaucomas, which are much more milder than the re refractory ones, you can see 30% uh, IOP reduction with a reduction in medications as well. What is definitely can, you can see here is in the better safety and pain profile. Whilst performing the micropulse, you can see that actually it probably doesn't cause much less pain at the time compared to a traditional continuous wave cyclodiode, but in the post-op period, it definitely seems to seem to be causing less pain. We also know that people use more power as they you look at the more recalcitrant glaucomas. So as the vision worsens, you put more power in and you get more IOP lowering. And this is done by simply adjusting these figures on the board. Now to look at the cost-benefit analysis, you can reuse the probe. And that changes things dramatically. Although we're not allowed to in our center, it's got a 90 minute cutoff. And in that 90 minutes, it's possible to do it six times, which makes it much more affordable. There's extremely low rates of thysis and hypotony as well, but you have to balance that against high redo rates. In our center, the 
the probe actually costs another 500 US dollars more than traditional TCP. But because it's safe, it does potentially open up a much larger market. Instead of just going for the recalcitrant glaucomas, you can also go for the ones with good vision now. Now, there's no cost of life, sorry, quality of life versus cost effectiveness data on this. So this is an area that we should be going into. But it seems as though because of this very safe profile that this laser has, it can be used much more early. And this means that it can be used almost in like a souped up SLT. So in cases where you would not normally consider doing an MPT, a normal, a normal continuous wave laser, you might do a MPTCP. So in conclusion, it's an interesting technology. It has a very good safety profile with, with variable efficacy. And it's definitely repeatable, but unfortunately may have to be repeatable many times. And it'd be interesting to see the results of some studies that will look at getting the ideal laser parameters. Thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, how, if you have a patient with refractory glaucoma, or how does, in comparison to like transscleral CPC, do you, you know, we, in the United States, we usually block these people, and with the micropulse, we usually have to do it in the operating room, whether with transscleral, we usually can do it in the clinic, I think the micropulse is a little bit more painful. Um, how does that fit into your whole armamentarium? Do you take them to the, the operating room? Yep. Do you choose one or the other, and how do you choose those between these two treatments? Right. So at the moment, um, we published on some of the, the causes of hypotony after traditional uh, continuous wave laser. We found that actually one of the, the largest causes of hypotony was having a previous diagnosis of neovascular glaucoma. Because you have some ciliary body shut down as well, ischemic ciliary body not producing enough fluid, and a blocked up trabecular mesh work that's not draining anything either. So hence because of that, and because of the ex good safety profile that this has, we've been using these TCPs, especially in the secondary glaucomas and those of the um, uh, neovascular type. However, because it's been so safe, we've been also using it in relatively good eyes, whereas previously our standard proce process for dealing with uh, very high IOPs, county fingers or worse, straight away to a psychodiode. In terms of the pain as well, it's very interesting. We've got very uh, mixed thoughts about how much pain it causes. Some people are actually doing it under subconj anesthetic, but I'm surprised at that because I think it's exactly the same as a psychodiode procedure. I probably maybe a touch more like your, your response as well. But um, definitely what's been shown is in the post-op period, because there's less inflammation, the patient feels it less. So Shamira, the, the energy you and the timing is variable like from 160 to 320. Yes. And the second issue is the position of the ciliary body. So like you do in patients who have juvenile glaucoma versus elderly glaucoma, the ciliary body the position is variable. Right. But here it's one size fits all. So I think isn't, isn't that a drawback with the current technology? Right. So the, it, when with, tr with traditional psychodiary, as you say, the ciliary body could be anywhere in post-traumatic places, neovascular, in congenital glaucoma, with boot thalamus, you know, it could be anywhere. So hence, we traditionally almost always use a light pipe to delineate that area. Now, the point of this is that it's less dependent on cyclodestruction and more on this outflow procedure through the uv pathway. And if you just go back a further amount, you're hitting the pars placata, the pars planar area, and that's the part that's meant to be used. So hence, the placement is, is a bit more forgiving. The only thing you do have to do is get the laser perpendicular to the area, because that means that it's kind of like more focused on the correct area that it's treating. And what is your post-operative regimen after you give this? How long do you give steroids or do you give non-steroidal anti-inflammatory? Right, so traditionally, my traditional answer to this is you would try to treat it to the um, inflammation in the, in the eye. And we would see our patients normally at two weeks post-operative, having had them on uh, Q3H, Maxidex, and Levofloxacin. Then we would see how the results were and uh, uh, probably tell it over the next, next two weeks. And if it doesn't work, how soon can you repeat? So in our study, we were repeating it at three months. Unfortunately, that is, for me, a bit of a disappointment. I, I must say, that's one of the things that I uh, had to, to deal with, you know, explaining to patients that it, really nothing has happened. But uh, I, I think, yeah, there's, the great news is that there's no real harm. We haven't had any severe hypotenuse yet. 
Question from the audience, go ahead. Physics. Actually, we haven't needed to because there is very little inflammation. Okay, so you just ha use antibiotic steroid combination, just that, and taper it off at around four weeks or two weeks? Total of four weeks. Total we'll four weeks. have a look at them at two weeks. There's no point having them the next day. Okay. And the next question was, how do you ensure uh, that the probe is perpendicular? How do you ensure that, you know, the probe is perpendicular? Because it needs to be angulated. So, um... How do you ensure that, you know, you have to... You, to make it perpendicular, you're, ac you're actually not sure, you know? Well, unlike the G-probe, which is cupped to yeah. get to the right angle, this is just straight, like it's like a pencil. Okay, so, so you just so paint around. So it's just your perception that it is perpendicular? That just Correct. That. And the addition of a coupling fluid is really useful. We weren't using a coupling fluid originally, but can you see from yeah. the, the video, it's, it's really a lot more focused, a lot more forgiving. If you tilt it slightly without coupling fluid, the, the laser is very so unfocused. So what type of coupling fluid you were using? So we use any sort of gel, uh, visitic gel. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And uh, one more question, have you used it in good vision patients? And what, what were the, what were the uh, you know, any complications that you've noted? No, that's exactly right. So we're using it far earlier than what we would normally do. And especially in the US, I hear that uh, this is one of the more common uses, which puts it more like a souped up SLT. Unfortunately, I have to take the patient to the theater, but it's giving you kind of that results. And there's, if you think about it, in some practices, there's quite a lot of patients who that could treat. Uh, but have you, you know... No, no uh, problems in that group, no, yeah. No we haven't problems. had anyone who go, going hypotenuse. Okay. Or any other complications of... Inflammation is the biggest one. Okay, because there are... Uh, in literature, there are studies which says that, you know, there was uh, around in, I think, 10 of their 60 eyes, which is around 10% of the cases they had, uh, you know, a decrease in vision by two lines, and there was cataract progression. Yeah, so those are... are well, maybe we haven't followed them up for long enough. That's the other thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, one more question. My question is about your, uh, the patients who required retreatment. You said 30%. Yes. Uh, so were these patients who showed no response at all in the first sitting and you wanted, or were they people who had some amount of response and you wanted to sort of uh, add on, uh, you know, further intraocular pressure reduction? Right. In almost all the cases, there's an initial drop in IOP. Even with your TCP cases, there's an initial drop. But it just seems to go back to exactly yeah. the same level, square, back to square one. So thank you, Shamira. We'll go